Hello, I'm Jordan Needham. This is JHAM 3D, and today our tutorial is gonna be talking about lighting, specifically portrait lighting. Now, if you're tired of just randomly placing lights around your blender scene until you finally find something you like, or who knows why you're here, portrait lighting applies to photography as well. There's a lot of lighting concepts that we're gonna be going over here, a lot of lighting basics that we're gonna be going over here, and so this won't just apply to portrait lighting, but it can be applied more broadly into environment lighting and specifically indoor lighting as well so if you're having trouble lighting your scenes this can definitely help you get rid of some of that guesswork and kind of have a template to work off of and propel you forward and if you're interested in downloading a blend file for this project you can subscribe to me on patreon to get that blend file so the first thing that we're gonna do here is um, I've already set up this backdrop right here and you can go ahead and do that yourself or you can download the project file as I mentioned. But I'm gonna go ahead and open another window by dragging this over here and I'm gonna leave this one on the left in solid view and I'm gonna put this one on the right later either in a material preview or rendered preview. So to begin, we're gonna focus on five different types of portrait lighting and then we'll move on to a couple more which I'll show you in the end, kind of bonus portrait lighting setups that um, I'll explain. But to start off, we're gonna be starting off with what's called flat lighting. And uh, as you can see in this picture, this little infographic provided by a, a dorm, a, a, uh, Ad, Adorama TV, wow, that took way too much. But Adorama TV, very good content over there on YouTube. Go ahead and check them out. I will include a link down below. They go over a, a lot of photography things and, and specifically lighting and stuff like that as well, much more than I know. But they are not in the 3D space. They're kind of just like in-person sort of lighting, not in a 3D scene. To start this discussion of these five different lighting setups, as you can see, it goes from flat to Butterfly, to Loop, to Rembrandt, and then Split. Why it's in this progression is actually because as you go further on down this progression, so starting at flat, you have very low shadows, and at the end, we have Split, which is very heavy, deep, and dark shadows. It's kind of like a spectrum, starting at flat, very low shadows, and at the end of that spectrum, you have Split, which is very deep and uh, heavy with the shadows. So that is why we're going in the specific order that we're gonna be going in. So let's begin by talking about flat lighting. Flat lighting is by far the easiest of these, I would say. It's literally just when you match the position of your light, uh, with the position of your camera, as you can see, I've oriented it basically right at the origin of this camera. It faces directly towards your subject. This is what flat lighting is basically gonna look like. And it really illuminates the entire face. It doesn't leave many shadows at all. And it kind of, if you're not careful with it, obviously it can blow out the face. But if you really have a subject that for whatever reason you wanna illuminate kind of the, the beauty of that subject, this is a great way to do that. And just to be clear, flat lighting does not mean there are no shadows. If you look closely, the chin will actually cast a shadow onto the neck a little bit. So look out for that too. So that is flat lighting. Super Super simple. Now we're gonna move on to butterfly lighting, also referred to as clamshell lighting at times. Why that is, is because usually in like the real world, sometimes you'll have a reflector of some sort, as you can see I placed right down here, but it's not actually doing anything. It's not doing anything impactful in the 3D scene, but this is just to explain the concept. If you're a photographer, you would be placing like a reflector of some sort to bounce this light. It's coming from this light up top, hitting your subject and then bouncing off, hitting that reflector and then being reflected back onto your subject. It's sort of like a fill light, which we will go over later on in this tutorial. But for this 3D scene, you don't need that reflector, obviously, because it's not really doing much. But that is the difference between butterfly and clamshell lighting is clamshell features this reflector and it creates some sort of clam-like line on the side of the subject's face, I believe, which is why it's given that name. So if you hear clamshell lighting, think butterfly, but like one extra step. Additionally, yet another name for this type of lighting is called Paramount lighting. Now avoiding too much of a history lesson, uh, this is basically because Paramount Studios used to use this while lighting some of their subjects and kind of popularized it back in the day. But I encourage you to research this more because I am not a historian, but rather I am a moron. So butterfly lighting, is very similar to fill lighting, except as you can see, instead of having our light directly in front of our subject, we have moved it up and angled it slightly down at our subject. So this is called butterfly lighting, specifically because 
of underneath the nose, it gives it sort of this like butterfly look shadow. And so that's what you're looking for. If you wanna know if you've been doing this right, that's specifically what to look for. I like the way that these things have been named because they're actually pretty distinct and easy to, to look for, you know? Okay, moving on, we got loop lighting. So loop lighting, this is when it gets kind of a little bit more, slightly more like experimental because it depends a lot on your subject. For instance, how long the subject's nose is or how big it is, because that's gonna affect the way that the shadows are casted onto the darker side of the subject's face. This light is actually gonna be in front and probably about 30 to 45 degrees off to the side of your subject and then angled towards the subject. As you can see, I've set up here. If you would like access to all the top views of these five different setups, I've included a link in the description below, which is a very nice article that shows all of these and explains you how to do them and uh, a lot of what we're going over today. So that's a great reference. So because we've moved a light to the side of the subject. Now, obviously we are not symmetrical. So we have a darker side of the face and a lighter side of the face. And as we progress down this list, that contrast on the light side and the dark side of the face should increase just a little bit. So loop lighting is going to cast um, shadows on the dark side of the face. But what you were looking for is a shadow done by the nose, but not much more than, um, than that. Like you don't want the more aggressive version of that, which you'll see in our next step. The shadows on this are fairly subtle, but they are very important. Obviously it's different than butterfly lighting, but you don't want the shadows to be too intense. Um, at least not for the base model. Now, if you want to start experimenting with these things, this is when we get kind of into the subjectivity of this and the creativity. If you're inside a blender or any sort of uh, 3D software, you can play around with the size of your light and affect the harshness of these shadows. I got a area light, which I'm using, and it's a one meter in size. Now, if I scrunch that down, you can see how the shadow of that nose and on the side of the face begins to get much more harsh. The lines there are like very distinctly formed. But as we go back up to one, it kind of feathers that out it kind of blurs it out you know a little bit and softens those shadows so depending on how you want to light that if you want a little more contrast between the shadow and the light side of the face then that is how you would play around with that but for now we're going to leave it about where it is at one to be totally honest with you guys i should mention that i think loop lighting is the one that i have the least down and i haven't had much practice with it where as these other lighting setups i have a lot more experience with so keep that in mind moving on from loop lighting our fourth lighting setup is is Rembrandt lighting. And now this one is very distinct for the sort of triangle shape that it sets on the darker side of the face. And again, you can place this light on either the left or right side of your subject, but this one is moved further to the side of your subject and rotated probably about 45 to 55 degrees off from the subject. So here's the top view. Again, you can reference the article that I have linked down below to see this. But here's the difference between loop lighting and Rembrandt lighting in the setups. So this is Rembrandt lighting. And then if we move over to loop lighting, you can see this light has been shifted from the loop lighting off to the side just a little bit more. Um, and specifically trying to cast a pretty distinct shadow off the nose and even further darken that dark side of the face and create this sort of triangle shape here. Now the reason this is called Rembrandt lighting is because of a Dutch painter that was famous for using this sort of lighting in his portraits. But as far as a visual reference for what this should look like, look for that sort of triangle shape on the darker side of your cheek. Did you think it was a real one though? So you could leave, etc. Moving on, we have split lighting. Now, split lighting, as you can see, is when the light is placed basically directly from the side of your subject. So it could be the left side or right side, but it creates this very distinct, heavy contrast shadow and a very bright side of the face and a very dark side of the face. So as you can see on the left, we have the face almost completely in shadow 
and then on the right we have a very illuminated face this is obviously a very harsh direction of lighting this is probably something that you won't use quite as frequently unless you're going for a very distinct and specific thing a specific feeling a mood split lighting is the least subtle and most dramatic out of all five of these lighting setups so probably not going to be used as often as say rembrandt or loop or even butterfly but definitely something that you want to know about and as you can see if we increase the size of this light we can soften the shadows just a little bit and uh, make it a little less harsh but I like the harsh shadow on this because I think it makes it kind of look badass and kind of aggressive but that's what I'm going for if you were going for something a little less intense definitely soften those shadows a bit okay so now we have finished those five types of portrait lighting which you can see have progressed from very little shadows to very dark shadows and has really kind of split the side of the face it's darkened the side of the face lightened another side so it's all about that contrast that increases as we go down that list so now I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk about a few more lighting templates that you can use and uh, go into the specifics a little bit so a very popular lighting setup is actually three-point lighting and you'll hear this talked about in almost every lighting tutorial because it's a very st like industry standard sort of one of the first things that you learn when you're learning about lighting it's a very good template to work off of because it kind of covers all the basics of lighting your scene and your portrait as well but it is very nice for lighting almost anything because it covers all the bases in a way and when you learn three-point lighting it teaches you a lot more about lighting in general so I think it's one of those things that you definitely should learn as a 3d artist who's lighting scenes or if you're a photographer as well I, I, I know that photographers are probably not watching this because I'm not a photographer and this is a 3d channel so if we take a look at our top view here we have a light on the left, a light on the right, and then a light behind them. So on the right, we have what is called our key light. And this is the light that is the sort of main light of the scene. This is what's supposed to do most of the illumination in the scene and really focus on a specific part of your subject. So our key light is hitting from the left. So that means the right side of the guy's face technically, but it's coming from the left direction. And then we can see that we're casting shadows onto the right direction which is the left side of the face now as far as placement of your key light goes typically it is off to the left or the right uh, just a little bit of your subject but it's really up to you technically speaking a key light really is just the light in any scene which is functioning as the key or main light source in your scene so it doesn't have to be portrait lighting and it also doesn't necessarily have to be in any specific spot because technically like if we look at our flat lighting setup technically this is a key light because it's the main light in the scene you kind of get what I'm getting at it'll make even more sense when I explain these other types of lights that we're going to be looking at okay so we have our key light which is off to the left side as we've talked about um, but you know the shadows on the left side of the guy's face so the right side of the screen is kind of harsh like I don't want my scene to look this dark I kind of want to have a brighter scene a brighter mood brighter feeling to this um, which is something you're always going to want to think about when you're lighting how does this make my audience feel how does this make the person looking at this feel what emotions does this evoke typically the darker obviously you're talking more moody and the lighter the scene you're talking a little more happy a little more easygoing kind of bright vibes right that's a very basic description but I think that's all we need for now so if you want to soften these shadows or kind of take the oomph away from these shadows and brighten this side of the face just a little bit, you can add what's called a fill light. And so this is the second light in our three point lighting setup. And what this has done is kind of just filled the space where our subject is a little bit darker and kind of softened those shadows and took the harshness out of it without playing with the size of our key light. Now your fill light is typically a pretty soft light and it's usually a lot dimmer than your key light. So if we're talking this key light is about 21 watts as it is now, you can see that this fill light of mine is only about one watt. So it doesn't take a lot. Sometimes it can be even like less than that 
you know it, it doesn't have to be a lot the purpose of your fill light is literally just to take the oomph and the harshness away from the shadows that your key light is casting so we got two out of three and now let's move on to our third type of light so adding in our third light we have what's called a rim light now your rim light is placed behind your subject basically directly behind and it's called a rim light because it creates this very obvious sort of rim around your subject the nice thing about a rim light is it separates your subject from what's behind them and so this can be a good way to do that and it also adds this like nice finishing touch to your lighting setup. So typically your rim light is the brightest light in your lighting setup, the most powerful one. So our key light right now is about 21 watts, whereas this rim light is all the way up to 100 watts. Now it's up to you how, how strong you wanna make it, but typically speaking, the rim light is the most powerful light in the scene. The uh, key light, the second most powerful in terms of brightness and wattage. And then the third least powerful is the fill light, typically speaking. The rim lights are also referred to as backlights at times. Now in this image, this is gonna sound confusing, but in this image, the backlight or the rim light is acting as the key light. So that kind of sounds confusing, but remember that a key light is just the main light source in your scene. So back to our three point lighting setup, all the lights enabled, our key light, our fill light, and our rim light, you can see what it looks like. With the rim light, adding this nice pop to the subject, popping it off the background, and the key light adding the majority of the light on the front of the subject, and then the fill light taking the harshness out of those shadows. Once you set this up, you can kind of play around with it just a little bit. You know, say you wanna cast different shadows on your subject, you can move your key light, and then according to that, you can also move your fill light based on you know where those shadows have been casted, how harsh they are, whether you want to soften them or whatnot. The last type of light that we're gonna be talking about is what's called a kicker. Now, a kicker is technically a rim light. It's just placed in a different position than your typical rim light. So some people might get a little specific and a little angry that I'm calling it a different type of light. It's not really, um, I don't know. I don't know how like gatekeeping people like in the photography world are. <laughs> or in the lighting world are. But basically what a kicker is, is a rim light. As you can see, this is where our rim light is, right behind the subject. Instead of it being right behind, it's a little closer to the back of the subject and then placed up just a little bit more. Once again, comparing it to the rim lighting, the kicker is closer and a little bit further up, angled down at your subject's head. In this case of our portrait, it casts light further down the forehead of our subject. So now that we've been over the rim light, key light, and fill light, and all these other lighting setups, including the three-point lighting, you probably started to notice that a lot of these are actually very similar. And that's kind of what I wanted you guys to notice, is that it, the little subtle things that you do to illuminate your scene and to illuminate your subject can have a very different feel it can totally change the way your scene looks and that's why it's very important that you're not doing too much guesswork in the lighting of your scenes and that you kind of have a direction of where you're going and this brings me off into a slight side tangent which is to make sure when you're going into a project as a 3d artist that you have written down what's called a project brief for artists that are professionals that work with clients and stuff this will be obvious to them but if you're sort of like a hobbyist or an amateur you know, just got new to this. Typing a project brief is something that's very important because it gives you direction and what you want to uh, do with your scene and the feelings you wanna invoke and uh, how you want your audience to see this, the story that you're writing. And without a project brief, you can kind of just be left to a ton of guesswork, not because you don't know anything, but because you've made it that way for yourself. You haven't put up any rules or boundaries. You haven't made any like world building per se. And so it's kind of just left to chaos like it's complete disorder well i don't know should i do this or should i do that should i use this light should i use this type of lighting or this type of lighting well i don't know the only way you can really answer that question is if you have a specific goal in mind write the story of your scene in your project brief what feelings you want this to invoke and just those two things alone can really help guide you whenever you hit a point where you keep guessing and you're not sure about something this gives you like a clear a more clear path into how you should do something for your scene because because once you've learned the basics about lighting, what's wrong and right about it is kind of up to the story that you've created and the feelings you wanna invoke. Because if you're trying to make somebody feel 
like, oh, this is very cinematic and this is a drama scene. But if you lit it to be a super bright scene that makes people feel really happy, then you probably didn't achieve what you were going for. Save some time, save yourself guesswork, write a project brief to make it more simple. So now that we've talked about key lights, fill lights, and rim lights, we can go back to our other lighting setups and see how we could potentially use, uh, say, a fill light in let's say your Rembrandt lighting setup. So in my Rembrandt lighting setup, I think the, you know, for what I want, the left side of this image, so the right side of the guy's face, it's just too dark. I don't want that. I want to kind of soften those shadows a little bit more, but I don't want to play with the harshness of my key light, which is the one that's casting the shadows onto the face. So I'm going to place a fill light on the opposing side of the face and as you can see it softens those shadows just a little bit more kind of brightens the scene overall and so you can use your fill light accordingly to help soften certain shadows in all of these different setups now for flat lighting and butterfly lighting you probably won't need fill lights uh, specifically for flat lighting because it does kind of flatten out the face and it does illuminate pretty much everything so there's not many shadows to fill this is not to say though that you should never use a fill light on butterfly or flat lighting it's just saying that it's probably less likely to be needed but ultimately it is up to you whereas um, the further you go down the list the more likely you are to need a fill light or want to use one so in our split lighting setup if we were to right now create a fill light i'm going to duplicate this key light and gx to move it over to the other side of the individual and then rz 180 to flip it around and then we're going to take the wattage down to like 10 and i'm going to title this fill and it's probably still a little bit too bright you know we don't want to get rid of that split distinct split lighting setup which is to create obvious contrast between the right and left side of the screen or vice versa. You know, we just got the keys to a new apartment. I haven't moved yet, but it's gonna be nice not living directly next to an airport, specifically a military base. Yes, I live next to a military base and I deal with this all the time. Every time I film, we got choppers, we got all different kinds of fighter jets. What is that thing, Tony Stark? Holy shit, right out of Stark Industries. This is crazy. The Avengers are here. There's two of them. There's two of them. Of them i don't know that whole russia ukraine thing might not have went so well holy shit sorry if you live in those areas uh that's a terrible situation so let's uh dim this fill light because i don't want it to be that i don't want it to illuminate the side of the darker side of the face that much so i'm gonna put this at about two watts and as you can see when we uh, disable it that's what it looks like very harsh shadows enable it we've softened it just a little bit more so what i'm teaching you there is a way to use your fill lights a little more practically and understand kind of get the hang of what a key light is what a fill light is and here are our five lighting setups with the fill lighting so you can see how there's less shadows it takes a little bit of that oomph away there's a little less drama whereas without the fill lighting there's more shadows it's a little more dramatic a little more intense and could probably invoke a little more intense of a feeling, a darker mood. Now let's talk about short lighting versus broad lighting. And we're gonna use the split lighting setup to demonstrate this. So when you hear somebody say short lighting or broad lighting, basically what they're referring to is which side of the face according to illumination is facing the camera. That sounds a little wordy, it might sound technical, but basically what it's saying is if your subject is rotated just a little bit, is the darker side of the subject's face facing the camera or is the more illuminated side facing the camera. And so in short lighting, the illuminated side of the face is furthest away from the camera, thus the darker side of the face is closest to the camera. And then in broad lighting, it's the other way around. So the darker side of the face is furthest away from the camera and the lighter, brighter, more illuminated side of the face is closest to the camera. And now in order for these to make sense, obviously you have to have a lighting setup that makes sense for this. So starting at loop lighting, 
and going to Rembrandt and then split lighting and even a three point lighting setup. That's when you can use either broad or short lighting and you'll see these techniques used by photographers all the time. Uh, but if we're using flat lighting, there's really no darker or lighter side of the face because it's head on directly facing your subject, not casting many shadows because a flat light is supposed to face directly in front of a subject and be head on. This kind of defeats the purpose of a flat light. Basically the same thing for a butterfly light using broader short lighting isn't technically correct because again, it's directly face on from the subject, but up and angled down just a little bit. You're taking away the butterfly from the bottom of the nose and uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Whereas when we get to the kind of more contrasty, more dramatic parts of these lighting setups, so like loop lighting, then we can start seeing how a broad lighting setup where the darker side of the face is the furthest away and then a short lighting where the uh, darker side of the face is closest. We can see how this affects it just a little bit more. So it works for loop lighting, Rembrandt lighting, and split lighting very well. Basically any lighting setup in which one side of the face is brighter than the other. Now I have a couple of bonus lighting setups that I'd like to show you. These are less practical and they are used more sparingly and it's pretty rare to see them used because their use cases are very specific. So first off we have this kind of what I'm calling over lighting, which is where you place a light a key light basically right above your subject which is going to cast a bunch of shadows from the facial features onto the face so you can see as we leave that key light right above our subject the nose gets a lot of heavy shadows the bottom lip creates a heavy shadow the eye socket creates heavy shadows as well uh, as for why you would want to do this i think it does make your subject look a little more intimidating because there's so many shadows on the subject's face and it's definitely not a beauty sort of lighting set up like butterfly lighting is or like uh, flat lighting is but more so like very harsh, intimidating sort of lighting setup. Moving on to a little more common one, which is one you'll see a lot in horror lighting setups and um, horror movies as well, is under lighting where the key light is in front of the subject and positioned angled upwards. So like directly up towards the ceiling or up towards the sky, 90 degree angle towards the sky. And what it does is it casts a shadow onto the top of the subject's face using the nose and eye sockets as well, creating shadows on that forehead, as you can see, and shadows onto the nose. As to why you use this, again, it's supposed to be pretty dramatic, like insanely dramatic. And it's supposed to be kind of creepy, which is why I've changed the color of this light to be a little bit more of a reddish color because this light setup is almost going to be uh, specifically used for horror scenes or in a scene where you want to make your character look really intimidating where you want your character to come off as sort of a bad guy an enemy a villain that's why i've made this light a little bit red and then on top of that because it's very very harsh um to kind of make it look cinematic i've added a fill light just above the subject and very, very dim and made it a blue color, which has basically made the shadows on the subject slightly blue tinted, which is something you see a lot in cinematic lighting, is to make your shadows slightly in the blue. And then just why not? I added a rim light, which uh, makes the subject pop off a little bit more from the background. It looks pretty cool, although it kind of does remove the intimidation from the character. So you might not want to keep that on. You might be thinking like, hey, this guy's supposed to be teaching me and he can't even decide on whether or not to use this light or not and that's kind of the point like I'm trying to explain to you that you don't have to use an exact template but use the knowledge that you've learned from this video about key lights fill lights rim lights all these different lighting setups and what they achieve and you can use that to formulate your own sort of lighting setup okay so that covers all the lighting setups that I'm gonna be showing you today but there's a few final details that I'd like to include when it comes to lighting your scene which should answer a few of your questions if you're wondering by this point in the video Let's talk about natural versus artificial lighting. And we're not going too in depth about this, but basically you can create most of these lighting setups. You can get very close to those setups using natural lighting, i.e. the sun. It just obviously depends on the time of the day, where the sun is positioned and where your subject is according to the sunlight. Photographers use this all the time when they're doing outdoor shoots. And that's why it obviously matters the time of the day when you're shooting something.
something as a uh, cinematographer, as a photographer. So that's something to take into account. And so as a 3D artist, you can obviously simulate or recreate that sort of setup using a sun lamp, which I'll add in for this demonstration. Um, so if we wanted to add sort of a Rembrandt setup, I'm gonna shift A, add in a sun lamp, and then I'm going to position it kind of off to the side of our character, just for visual reference, because technically, so the position of the sunlight in your blender scene technically doesn't matter because in real world units, the sun is obviously millions of miles away, which would be a lot to calculate for Blender and there's no necessity to do that. Blender just calculates a sun lamp as more of an all encompassing sort of light. So the position of it doesn't matter, but rather the rotation is going to dictate where that sunlight is hitting. Because the sun is so powerful in real life, Blender kind of calculates it for one, the watt values, the power values are just on a scale of one to 10 by default, because the actual power, the actual wattage of the sun is obviously ridiculous. I don't remember the number, but uh, it's super, super high. So to include that would be kind of ridiculous. So in short, sun big, sun powerful, blender small, blender weak. Using blender, the correct power, the correct strength of the sun, according to the real world, would be 750 on the strength. And I know you're like, hey, that's really, that looks horrible. Look how harsh those shadows are. Look how that's horrible. But that is technically correct according to the people that have done the math, right? And so how you would deal with that and anybody that's a photographer, or cinematographer would know, you have to adjust your exposure, which is in your uh, render properties and under color management. And you would put that down until you get to an area where you kind of like it. Now let's rotate the sun on the Y axis, move it up, and I'm gonna try to create a Rembrandt setup using the sun. In this scenario, this is your key light. The sun is your key light. Okay, so obviously we're not there yet, but as you can see, the distinct triangle uh, in a Rembrandt setup is starting to form on the side of the face. I would have to do a lot more, um, a little tweaks to the rotation of the sunlight and the direction that it's hitting the character in to make it correct. But if you were to use the sun as your key light, this is how you would do it, right? It just, it's very simple. You can also use HDRIs basically in a replacement of your sunlight and it gives you more realistic light because it has all that color data, all those different colors in it. As you can see, let's try to make a Rembrandt setup again. Uh, you can get pretty close. You can see that triangle starting to form on the face. So one last thing I wanna touch on is real world values for lights. I'm not gonna go too in depth on this. If you want me to, I could make a kind of spin off of this video in the future going in more detail about this. But as you can see, we adjusted the sunlight to be 750 strength which is realistic according to the way Blender corresponds to the real world sun. And then if you load that up with the rest of your lights, the rest of your lights are gonna be very dim in comparison. Technically that is correct because in the real world, obviously the sun is extremely powerful compared to lights that we have in our houses. And so that's why if you use the sunlight and it's like way too high, you can't see the rest of your lights, like they're not affecting the scene very much. You would have to find the real world values of these things, uh, which you can look up on the internet, obviously. Pick what kind of light you're gonna use, right? If you wanna use like a LED light, you know, look for the common household LED light and a wattage that those things typically put out and then um, type that in. And then you're gonna have to adjust just your um, exposure to make sure that all those lights come through the way that you want them to. And it can be sort of a tedious process, but in this video uh, with our artificial lights, we technically did not use real world values. If you wanted to do that, you could look that up on the internet. There are times where you're gonna need to do that as a 3D artist. All right, so that concludes today's tutorial. If you want access to the blend file that I use that has the templated lighting setups, I think there's about eight of them, but you can make a ton of different combinations of it. Like, the possibilities are almost endless with all these different lights. Uh, There's great structure to work off of, great template to work off of. I will include that in the description below, either by Patreon or Gumroad. I also want to give a shout out to the creator of the male base model that I used in this video, and the link to that model is in the description below. That model probably won't be included in the blend file that I share with you because of copyright reasons, but you can use your own subjects and adjust the lights accordingly to get very similar results. 
using the principles that I've taught you in today's video. Though everything in this video is not quite perfect, and I know there's a lot of teachers out there that could probably do this more justice, I hope this was very helpful for you. That being said, I'm Jordan Needham. This has been jham 3 d Hit that subscribe button and that notification bell for more content on the way. I can't wait to grow this community. And as always, I will catch you next time.